So whilst Josh is looking, my point is now this. We've confirmed yeah. that someone can be a virgin and an Alma because Genesis yeah, has confirmed to us that this can happen. So now, Obviously. if we go to Isaiah 7.14, he is now trying to rule out that if you're an Alma, you can't be a virgin. No, 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 no. We don't said, we, don't put words that in they, my they, mouth. They, they, we just said that this other verse can't yes. call her a virgin. Okay. We didn't say that an Alma can't yes. be a virgin. He calls her an Alma. But that's my okay. point. You're okay. using Cain's okay. argument. This is nonsense. So, so this is utter nonsense. What I'm going to show you now oh, it can be a virgin, is, therefore it is a virgin. Nonsense. So the, if the possibility is it can be, because what he's going to say in the Septuagint, it uses the word Parthenos. Now here's the Septuagint, and in that verse, for what you've just stated, it uses Parthenos for all three ones. Yes. So therefore it... That's written in Greek, correct? Who was it written by? It was written by in Greek, correct? Yes. It's in Greek, the same word for girl and uh, virgin, they're the same word. In Greek, you are a, vir you are a girl until you lose your virginity. And who was the Septuagint written by? By, oh well, are you talking about the... The, the 70. The, are you talking about the Septuagint in antiquity? This. Are you talking about the Septuagint we have today? The Septuagint Because this is not debated amongst scholars. If you look on Wikipedia, you can see this Who is true. was it written the by? The Septuagint that we question. currently have is written by Christians. Who? We, we have the it's Isaiah to do with scrolls. The so I'm asking you, like... The Septuagint what, we have today was written by Christians. Who wrote the Septuagint originally? What was the... Uh, oh, the original Septuagint? Yes. Or this Septuagint? The, the, just semantics. Let's <laughs> no, start no, no, with no, the that's beginning. that's not semantics. Let's that's start the with the whole beginning. argument you're about who, to make. Who was, I'm undermining who the was, entire was, argument you want to make. And you're no. very annoyed. Answer the question. That, who was who was who this. was the Septuagint written by? Who does answer both? Well, I, I, I'll answer both. The right. first Septuagint was written by 70 rabbis. Don't cut me okay. off. Don't cut me off, Ali No, Tawa. but I was asking you a question that I wanted one, you to answer. And the current one we have is not written by Jews, it was written by Christians. Now, this is the thing. He said the current Septuagint is written by Christians, but Matthew was written in the first century. So Matthew could not have been using the Septuagint written by Christians. Exactly. So therefore, the therefore, point is... Matthew is, is wrong. There, how could Matthew was wrong. See, was he's now by... refuted his own point because he has agreed that the original Septuagint was written by the 70. Matthew quotes from the Septuagint no, written by the 70. He does not quote from the Septuagint. Yes, he does. No, he doesn't. Because Matthew quotes from the Greek. Or if you look, any scholar will tell you, most of the biblical statements are taken from the Septuagint. The whole the... book is written in Greek. And the All the Gospels and the Epistles are written the in quote, Greek. Because the structure of the uh, sentences are different from the Masoretic text. So therefore, when a scholar looks at the Greek, they can see where they got the constructs from because the construct of the sentence matches the Septuagint. So therefore, you even if we listen to your argument, you try to then say the Septuagint was written by the Christians. But, but the, math, the book of Matthew came before the Septuagint by the Christians. So therefore, the only thing he could have been quoting from is the Septuagint written by the 70. Well, that's not true, because the Septuagint written by the 70, we know, was only on the five books of Moses and not on the prophets or writings. And therefore, there was no, no. Septuagint on Isaiah at that time. Again, you're mistaken, because I I don't have the evidence on me, but of not. the Septuagint, there were more books that were written gradually over time, before the time of Christ. This is why Christians bring up this whole point of it referring to a virgin, but then Jews refer to this Masoretic and the, the, the Hebrew to say, well, it says Alma. But if you look at the writings of many of the quotations from Matthew, because he was obviously a Jew and he, was, did not write he, book of he was he was writing, we're not going to go on a tangent, but again, the book of Matthew is written to a Jewish audience. So he actually uses more verses from the Old Testament yes. and he uses the uh, Greek true. Septuagint for those verses. And scholars will confirm to you because why? They look at the structure of how he quoted things and the majority of what he says was taken from the Septuagint. Let me ask you a very simple question that you should be up. Quick question about you're saying the Septuagint was written by Christians, the one that we've got now. Yes. That, I find that a little bit strange. Because in Isaiah 9, the, the section where it goes, he'll be called Wonderful yeah, Counselor, yeah, yeah. the Mighty God, yeah. that, is, that, that isn't in the Septuagint. Why would a Christian... We're not talking about Isaiah 9, we're talking about Isaiah yeah, 7. I'm saying in the Septuagint, that passage of the Septuagint doesn't have... Yes, but that's also been, that's, that's been mistranslated. Miss that bit out? Because the, the, that, that seems a, a little bit... Uh, well, it's quite simple really, strange. because that verse has been mistranslated. But why would a Christian... Why would they mistranslate a verse? No, no, because they've got... No, I'm saying why would a Christian mistranslate it in a way that seems to 
not back up the Christian theology. No, it mistranslates it in a way that does. No, I'm saying they miss out the bit that says it's the mighty God in the Septuagint, whereas in the Masoretic text it actually does Because they're not quoting from the Septuagint, that's my whole point. Okay, so... My whole point is they're not quoting from the Septuagint. But Josh doesn't know. He needs to read up. He needs to look, read up. Look, Josh needs to read clear. up on his history this, this, this because is, he's. You're, you're, this is very clear. This is yes. Very, look, I have a very simple question for you. If if you were writing, if you were writing the book of Matthew, mm -hmm. okay, and you wanted to to convince Jews of Jesus being the Messiah, and by doing so, you wanted to yeah. prove that. Okay, you wanted to show that he. You're not listening to a word I'm saying. You, yeah, right, yeah. And by doing we'll, we'll so, anyway. and by doing so, you wanted to, uh, to, to uh, in order to do so, you wanted to quote verses, okay, showing how Jesus fulfilled this prophecy and that prophecy. What would you quote from? Would you quote from? Wait, 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 hold, hold on. No, 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 I'm sticking to Isaiah. Would you quote from a translation or the original? Would you check? Uh, okay, now this is something that, that you know from, from a court of law. Okay, we have a very important principle in law that the, the original text is always. The original text is always what we consider <laughs> in, 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 instead of the translation. Because a translation by nature is a commentary. Because when you translate between different languages, things are obviously are going to get lost because different languages have different ways of saying things. Now, therefore, there's no reason to suggest that whoever wrote the Gospel of Matthew, and I highly doubt it was Matthew himself, um, whoever wrote that book, who was writing to try to convince Jews, would have decided to quote verses using a translation instead of the original Hebrew. That makes no sense. Why would somebody do that? Well, it, it's very clear why they would do that. In the first century, did they use the Targums or the Hebrew Bible? Well, they used both. Okay. Did a majority of the Jew Israelites speak Hebrew in the first century? Well, the majority? I don't know statistics. I don't know. There wasn't a census done. Did it done. become a lost language? Well, at that point, it probably was not a lost language, no. So everyone spoke, because even if you go to scholarly consensus, they'll say most people spoke Aramaic. Yes, not so, Greek. Yes, no, they would have understood Aramaic, um, sorry, Greek as well. because Well, it was only, under... the, uh, only the Hellenized Jews would have, would have understood Greek. Right, so my point is this. This is why people would have understood the Septuagint as well, because it was translated by Jews. Why? Because as it became part of the kind of Greek empire and so forth, Therefore, this we had. I've understood your conversation that the speaking area is now closed. Okay. You wish to carry on these bikes going to Marble Arch or whatever, but this area has to be cleared now. Okay. okay. Safe journeys. Right, should we wrap up? Yeah, we'll, we'll wrap up. We'll have to wrap up. I'll have to continue after lockdown. Um, it's just. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a conclusion outside. Alright, All right, we're going to do a conclusion outside. Hi right, everyone. Yeah, maybe we'll, we can do an online, con co continue online or something. Alright. Yeah, okay. We'll take this outside, man. We'll take this Let's outside. Take it outside. Yeah. Can you hold this? They're actually closing the whole park. Yeah. Including the kids and gardens. I wanted to climb it because so. sometimes you eat, like. Yeah. Don't worry, next time we'll do the whole park. I don't. I don't know how to. I don't know how to do that. I've never. I've never used stream. I don't know how okay. to do that. Right, so maybe my my sister's more into the. My sister's more into these technological things. So I'm, I'm sure she explained to me how the camera works in the first place, so she can probably help me out. Yeah. 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 What's the name of your YouTube channel? Jews at the corner. Jews at the corner. Yeah. Do you see one I've seen you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Only your cap. Only the recorded the last. Yeah. The last one. No, Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just explaining. Uh, no. I've seen you on the Soho channel. Yeah. 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 Uh, I know you're paying oh, two minutes. <laughs> Still recording, I tell me. <laughs> I, 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 I is this recording? Yeah, it is. If, uh, if it is, then you've got a scene of that guy, that guy yelling peace and love. <laughs> you can edit it out as you want. Yeah, I probably will. So, Josh, you will conclude, but we just do three minutes, three minutes. We'll time it because we. All right, then. So it's not. Well, they're locking over. the gates. Yeah.
When did they start doing this, locking the gates? Well, the Royal Cause... Parks are usually closed at night. Oh, really? Yeah, they're probably closing early. These unsuspecting people have come into the park not knowing that they're about to be kicked out. They didn't do that last week. They did this last week. Oh, when I went to my walk and I came back, I was after that. Can you... Is it still recording? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have a... Can you just do a quick time? You got your phone? Like a turban. You, you, on your phone or something? Yeah. Okay. Alright then. Three minutes for you and then three minutes for me. Yeah, yeah, Where's yeah. the mic? He's got the mic. Alright, cool. Put it here. Yeah, but can't he pick up both of us? Yeah, but because he's... Like, you, you start your two minutes and then... I'm not yeah. pass it over to him. Okay. Yeah? Alright, two minutes. Yeah, uh, can someone just... Um, Two or three minutes? Three minutes? Okay. Yeah. Alright, stars. Now. Okay, so we've moved outside because we've been moved by the police. Now, basically what I was saying is that Matthew generally quotes from uh, the Septuagint, which is the Greek, and anyone can go online and search that. So this is why there were certain things, or it was translated in um, Greek as Parthenos. So what Joshua was trying to, he had, was trying to say, he had different points. One that Alma doesn't necessarily mean virgin, but obviously we went to uh, Genesis 24, which shows there was three different words used for Rebecca, and one of them was virgin. So during, we have to think about the context of that time. People who were generally of that age were generally a virgin. So yes, Isaiah doesn't necessarily specifically mean Alma means virgin, but in the context of that time, it would have been perceived as a virgin. Just like if I say to someone an adolescent, they would also be seen as a virgin till like today where it may not necessarily be true also what joshua will try and argue is that the structure of the sentence is past in in the past tense but josh also knows you have something called uh, is it the, the vav conditional vav with, conversive. conversive where in in there. in biblical uh hebrew there is no such thing as past tense as we have in modern hebrew so when we look at the verses there is something what we would describe as the prophetic tense and if Josh can quickly go to um, Numbers no actually in Exodus it talks about you don't need to look at it, I'll find it but it talks about the Lord says to Moses this day I have set you free but the Exodus had not happened yet so what we see many times in prophetic um, it, prophetic statements is that they can be talk, spoken about in the past tense and I'll try and find the verse for you and we can have a look at it. Okay, so okay, in response, wait, wait, let me, let me in response to what Paperboy has said, uh, uh, is, this the, is this the end? Are we concluding no, no, now? No, no, we'll just do a, a few more. One, one thing I want to oh, Okay, fine. Yeah, no, so in response to what Paperboy has said, first of all, the rabbis never made a Septuagint on the prophets, as I said before. Matthew was not quoting from a, from a Septuagint. And there's no reason to quote from a, from a translation when you, can trans, when you can quote from the original, obviously. And furthermore, furthermore um, the, the verse in question which Paperboy is talking about in Exodus um, is not talking about a prophecy. This is not saying, uh, he's not, he doesn't mean I will set you free. When, he, when God says, I have set you free, it means, and God does this a lot, it means that I have done it, it's as good as it, it means it's as good as done. Because God's word, God always fulfills his word. And therefore, whenever God says, I have done something, okay, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually happened already, it means it's as good as done. And another explanation, not that one is necessary, is that of course God is above time. And therefore, whenever, whenever God, God is looking upon something, it can, it can have happened, it can not have happened, right? It's, it, it, he's, he's above time. He sees all the, t uh, all the events of, the, uh, of, of time, past, present and future, all at once, because he is God, obviously. So, um, and uh, and what, what else did you say? Oh yeah, of course. Um, if we go to Proverbs chapter 30, we see very clearly that, uh, that Almo there is not talking about a virgin. So 
So, uh, so Paperboy's assertion that just because by Rebecca it uses all three, verse, uh, all three words to refer to her, and one of them is a virgin and one of them is Almo, does not mean that Almo means virgin. So, so, two minutes. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll switch over. That was two minutes and and I yeah. That was so, so now, again, Josh is confirming what I've, I've been saying. And I'm going to go into another point. So he just said that God speaks in... We're going to have to wrap up. We're running out of battery. Okay. Well, I did we'll do. I had so Josh said that God is outside of space and time. So therefore he can talk about something in the past because it's already done. That's why we say it's a prophecy. So even though I have confirmed that there is no WAV consecutive, so there is no such thing as a true past tense in the biblical text, Many, even if you go to the 1970 um, JPS, it says the virgin shall conceive, but they have now revised it to say she has conceived. Because if you look at the rest of the sentence, it speaks of the father naming the child in the future tense. Now, this is the thing. If it is a prophecy, what Josh said can still apply. That God has already, knows it's already done even if it's something to happen in the future because God does not stay, um, is not constrained by space and time. So Josh has not actually refuted my point. He's actually helped my point. So, um, right, come back on that? Yes, you may. All right then. Well, th this, is, this, is, this is just absurd because the word has conceived in, Zev in Isaiah 7, 14 does not have a vav conversive. There is no vav conversive there. It is in the pluperfect. It says the word hora, which means has conceived. It is no verb conversive. The, the, the idea that there's no real past tense in Biblical Hebrew is, is nonsense. Because whenever you don't have a verb conversive and it's using the, what's known as the perfect form or the perfect tense, that is only past tense or, or more accurately the pluperfect tense, meaning had done already. Okay? There is no time when you find a pluperfect tense, um, a pluperfect tense word referring to the future. And I might add, that the context of Isaiah 7, which I'm sure Paperboy um, might have read in preparation for this, but most missionaries have never read the whole of Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7 does not talk about the future. Isaiah 7 talks about what's going on then. It's talking about a siege with King Ahaz, right? What happens? Okay. King Ahaz, king of Judah, is besieged by the kings of Aram, King Resin, and the king of Israel, right? That's uh, King uh, Pekach. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and Isaiah says to Ahaz, pray to God, he'll give you a sign, the siege will be over. And Ahaz says, no, I don't, I don't want to pray to God. So he says, well, we're going to give you a sign anyway. And then he says, what's the sign? Okay, he, he's, he says the sign is that the young woman, okay, is, uh, it, it ha who has conceived, he says, horror, as I keep saying, it's in the proof perfect, there's no vav conversive here. It's a lie that there's a vav conversive in this word. It doesn't exist. It's spelled hey, reish, hey, horror. Has conceived, will give birth to a son. You should call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Okay, it's perfectly normal to have names in Hebrew that mention God in it. It doesn't make the person divine, like, for example, Daniel or Michael or Gabriel. It's, they all got God in the name. And, and what's the sign about this? That by the time this child, Emmanuel, um, it, it, that before this child, Emmanuel, is able to tell the difference between good and evil, the siege will have lifted. Well, uh, let me tell you something. If, 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 uh, if, if, the, if, if this really is talking about Jesus, that's a mighty long siege. Okay, so now... <laughs> now, Joshua's talking about the tense used in the Isaiah 7, 14. Can you open your Tanakh? Of course. Does it have the word Yoledet? Yoledes, yeah, that's a... What that, tense is that? That's a participle, the present tense. Present tense. So yes. you have past tense, now the present tense. Yes. And also the word cool. What, what tense is that? That's in the future, I know that. So, it's a, so you have, now you're saying part, you have past, present and future. But All you want us to verse. believe that it's something that has happened in the past. Well, the conception has happened in the past because that's the, ver that, that, that's the verb which is in the past. But that's the thing. It's it, Using it in conjunction, the past... Uh, part, past perfect is that what that is why if you look at the JPS 1917 they put the she shall conceive because when you look at the whole structure of the sentence because you have the past present and that's why I said you don't have something as a proper past tense so when you have she is given the tense is almost she's given birth 
but then he will call in the future. So this is why I've said. No. Okay, so now, the, no, tell no. us the tenses. Holo is I, I just the, asked the question. Okay, holo is in the past tense. Holo means has conceived. She has conceived in the past tense. Sorry? There you are. Okay. Can you maybe ask somebody else to hold it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, but. Um, so, Hora is in the past tense. Yeah. Yoledes is a participle, okay? That's present tense. And the Koros, that has a conversive, by the way. That's in the future tense. Okay, but just to kind of quickly get to it, because we've been going on for such a long time. Yes. There is one thing I want to conclude on, is that who is um, Yosef Ben David? Or Yosef Ben David. Sorry, the, the Messiah Ben David. Is oh, it? The oh, you want to talk about the Moshiach Ben David? Yeah. Maybe we should leave that for next time. You just yeah. a quick, quick one. I want to give a quick introduction on... Moshiach Ben Yosef and Moshiach Ben David. Yes. Right. Well, according to rabbinic tradition, there are going to be two messiahs. The first is going to be the Moshiach Ben Yosef. And depending on how, uh, on whether or not the, the Jewish people as a whole are, uh, are, are righteous or wicked, um, he will either be killed or not be killed. And um, he'll be followed by the Moshiach Ben David, who will actually bring the full redemption. Okay, and just to summarize, and uh, and if the Moshiach Ben, Yo uh, and according to some opinions, Moshiach Ben Yosef will actually be resurrected by Moshiach Ben David. And uh, either way, whether he was killed and resurrected or he was never killed at all, they will actually reign in con uh, 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 reign as two kings together. Moshiach Ben David being the main king, Moshiach Ben Yosef being the, uh, the, the 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 other king. Okay, so the reason why I just wanted to conclude to this is maybe in our next discussion we'll talk about this. Now, the Jews always talk about a Messiah, but now we know there are apparently two Messiahs and one is apparently going to be killed. Why? Where did they get that from? Because Chris, Christians have always argued that there's one, because what the Jews will say, there's Jesus wasn't a Messiah because he didn't fulfill everything. Now, we, we, look, we look within Judaism's text and you have two messiahs one who apparently gets killed and one who then reigns for like however long a very long time his kingdom is said to last for eternity Christians will argue that there was a messiah who did die and he did rise and he will have a kingdom that is everlasting but I find it very interesting that they have a concept of two messiahs and one who will die and one who will then come after him messiah ben David who then will establish the kingdom and we'll go into that the next time. We'll talk about that next time. Thank yes. you very much. So that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's all for yeah, us. Yeah, just do a wrap up. So just in, in terms of our wrap up, and I'll leave Josh with the last word. So basically what I wanted to go through today is looking at the rabbinical text and saying, they accuse us of misappropriating what is in the Tanakh. And when we go through certain verses, biblical verses, that we say are messianic, many of the times you will see that rabbis have said that this verse is about the Messiah. Even though rabbinical Jews today don't accept and they may say it's about the nation of Israel or so forth. But the question remains, where did these people, who are supposed to be very learned people, how could they make such basic errors in saying this is about the Messiah when it was clearly about the nation of Israel? Why, and that's why I asked Josh, what is the criteria to determine whether a verse is messianic or not? Because these are not layman people. Jonathan Ben Uzel attributing a verse to the Messiah is a very significant thing. He was not a layman. He was one of the, if not the greatest rabbis to have lived. And he makes such basic errors in his Targum translation. So the thing is this, they accuse us Christians of misappropriating the text, but we even see rabbis who have said the same thing. So why are, again, are Christians accused of abusing the text when even rabbis have read the text and assumed the same sort of things that Christians have. So in conclusion, what I will say is this, those verses that you go through, if you accept they are messianic, there is no unequivocal way you cannot accept Christ as the Messiah because Jesus even said these sort of things. He, he was the stone that was rejected and is now the cornerstone. So if you then take the Jewish perspective and say, well, these verses aren't messianic, then it will not lead you to Christ. But it still doesn't resolve the problem that some of these rabbis thought it was messianic. So that's why I asked the question, what is the criteria to determine if something is messianic? And why did so many rabbis make an error 
in concluding that these verses were about the Messiah. Thank you for your conclusion. And that's to, just to conclude on my part. It seems that from, through this debate, Paperboy has not actually addressed any of the arguments that I made about the Vinical text, which is why he moved so swiftly after I'd explained it all onto Isaiah 714. He didn't care about the arguments that I'd made, and he did not address a single one of them. My entire argument was that the Midrashim, these rabbinical texts that he is talking about, are all Agadic Midrashim, okay? Not intending to take verses literally, not intending to take verses in context, all intending to, take, to, to use verses out of context to illustrate points. And Paperboy failed to address this fundamental argument as to the nature of Medrash. And all of these rabbinical texts that he's quoting are indeed from Medrash, okay? Or at least Midrashim quoted in the Talmud. And, uh, uh, and nobody would ever think that Zechariah 14.2 is talking about the Messiah. Nobody thinks that, 11, that Isaiah 11.4 is talking about the kingdom of the Messiah coming back to him, okay, because nobody sees in the text the kingdom being taken away from him in the first place. Therefore, we see clearly that the rabbis were not quoting these verses in Isaiah 53 in context. They were using them to illustrate a point. And when we look at all the different verses, this is really the last point, when we look at all these verses, where the, all these times when the rabbis quote, uh, quote Isaiah 53, they all have one common thread. They are all quoting, uh, talking about righteous Jews, whether it's all the righteous Jews, or just Rabbi Akiva, or just Moses, or just Elazar, uh, Pinchas bin Elazar, or just the Messiah, or uh, whoever else, right? It's, or Jeremiah, according to some. It's all talking about righteous Jews, and that's the point, because the servant of God is the one who serves God, the one who serves God with all his heart and with all his soul. And that is really the message of the Tanakh, not a message of a dying, of, of a dying Messiah figure bo born of a virgin for no apparent reason and, uh, and part of God himself who gets to cleanse you of all your sins without you doing any effort. Thank you, Thank you for your time, Josh. Until next time. And and also you can um, subscribe to Josh's channel if you ever want to watch his discussions. Yeah, Jews, Jews at the corner. At the corner. Yeah. So um, yeah, we're going on lockdown now. So hopefully at some point we'll kind of uh, have another conversation. Maybe we'll focus on one or two texts rather than tr okay. trying to jump through too many because that's what I was trying to do. Move the conversation forward very quickly. Um, but hopefully we'll have a another part three about the two messiahs within Judaism because most people aren't aware that Jews are expecting two messiahs so until next time thank you George thank you guys thank you thank you guys